All right, ladies. Uh, where did we leave off with Cordesins? We left off. Oh, yes, I remember where we left off. We left off looking at this graph. Charlotte, what is this graph? What does it mean? What is it saying? What's going on in this graph? Then we're talking about photosynthesis, right? And photosynthetic organisms, which is not just plants, right? First started off in bacteria, uh, evolved the ability to capture sunlight energy and use it to make food. Okay? Uh, trivia question. What do you call an organism that uses sunlight to make its own food? It's not a heterotroph. A heterotroph is something that has to eat other things to get food. What does something that makes its own food, what's it called? It's called a, remember this? It's called an autotroph, yep. It's called, and if it uses sunlight, it's called a photoautotroph, okay? Um, so photoautotrophs are things that use sunlight to make their own uh, energy. So plants make their own food, and then they eat the food that they make. So they use cellular respiration, like what we just studied, to break down the uh, sugar that they make. We can't make our own sugar from scratch. Plants do. Now, to do that, they need to capture sunlight. They have some pigments that they use. The primary pigments are the chlorophylls. And you can see that the chlorophylls do a really neat job of uh, capturing sunlight in this range here, the blues or, or uh, violets, and in this range here, which is towards the red end. Um, if you looked at the rate of photosynthesis, how quickly sugar is being made, you'll notice it's really high here in the in, where the blue spectrum is, and it's really high where the red is, because that's where you're getting most of your energy. So what would happen if you give a plant yellow light? Just yellow light. Imagine we put a color filter and the plant only got yellow light. Would it do well? What do you think? Probably not. Probably wouldn't do well. Or green. Green also corresponds to pretty low sugar production. Okay. Maybe even orange, not so good. These colors in the middle, plant would not make too much sugar. Probably would die. Okay. Um, now. We talked about, we left off actually on this slide, right? So this is a slide that um, actually talks about an experiment. And the experiment was done by a scientist named Engelman. And what he wanted to know was he wanted to know uh, about the uh, oxygen production. Because we know that in photosynthesis, you get um, a waste product, right? And the waste product is what? What do you get from photosynthesis? What do you get? What's that waste product that you get? So that's the O. It's oxygen. It's O2, oxygen, right? So he wants to, he had a question. He wanted to know what colors is photosynthesis? Like if, if you were to give a photosynthetic organism, uh, light. And you were to break up the light using uh, like a prism, right? He wants to know in what colors would you have the highest photosynthetic rates, okay? In what colors would you have the most oxygen? Because the higher the photosynthetic rate, the more sugar you make, but also the more oxygen you make. So he wants to know what were the colors that were best suited for photosynthesis. So he took a tank. And what he did was he put algae in the tank. And that's what these things, that's what this is. This is algae, okay? So this little, these are cells, okay? This little spiraling stuff, that's the algae. And he put the algae in the tank. And he put light into the tank, but he broke up the light using a prism. So part of the tank had uh, purple, part had blue, part had green, part had yellow, part had orange, part had red. And what he wants to know is where is the greatest rate of photosynthesis? Where is this happening? So what he did was he added aerobic bacteria. So these little guys are bacteria. And 
they use oxygen to make energy. So, solid respiration, what we talked about, right? Stage one, two, three, and four. And what he looked at is where are the bacteria going? And he noticed something. He noticed that the bacteria were clustered. There were a, a lot of bacteria in the blue area and in the red area. Why is that the case? Remember, they're aerobic bacteria, so what do they like? They like oxygen. So why do you think they're there? Right, so Emily said at those colors you get higher rates of photosynthesis, which means you produce more oxygen. So you would expect that aerobic bacteria would go to the area of where there is more oxygen. Okay, now, that's what the experiment proved. <clears throat> but a good scientist always wants to know if there is another explanation. Okay, you always want to know if there's another explanation. So what he did, uh, actually, before I tell you what he did, what do you think another possibility could be? So one hypothesis is, yeah, maybe they, they're there because there's more oxygen there. It's possible, right? But let's rule out another possibility. What could another possibility be? Maybe they're there because they like the colors. Uh, organisms are, I don't know about all organisms, but a lot of them are sensitive to colors. Some are attracted to certain colors, and some are repelled by certain colors. Like fruit flies are attracted to certain colors, and I uh, can't remember what the color is, right? So some organisms like colors, like brine shrimp, <clears throat> little crustaceans that live in a salty environment, they like specific colors, like green, and they avoid uh, other colors. Because I'm pretty sure they avoid other colors. But they have a sensitivity to green. So how do we know that these bacteria don't just like blue and red? How do we know that? Maybe they, Maybe they like blue and red. That's why they're there. So now we have two pro possibilities, right? Possibility one is they're there because there's a lot of oxygen. And by the way, that would correspond with, to this graph, right? You notice the peaks are where? The peaks are also in the blues and reds. So maybe one possibility is there because of the oxygen, or another possibility is there because of the color. How would you rule out the color? What could you do to rule out the color? What would you, yeah, you, you repeat the experiment. What would you take out of the experiment? Very good, Emily. Take out the algae. Just take out the algae. Let's redo the experiment. Let's take a tank. Let's put in a color filter. Add some light. Let's put in the bacteria. No algae, though. No algae. So no photosynthesis, right? And let's see what happens. If the bacteria go to the blue and red, you have a problem now. Because now you have, uh, a possibility that they're just going there because of the color. But if you notice that they don't really care where the color is, in other words, it's an equal amount of green, equal amount of yellow, then you know they don't care about the color. And then you know that the reason why they're doing this, the reason why there's a lot of them here and a lot of them over here is because of the oxygen levels. Okay? So that's the Engelman experiment. Okay? And that's explained uh, here. It showed that uh, the amount of oxygen was greatest in the reds and blues, okay? And that's because that's where the uh, aerobic bacteria was. All right. So let's talk about the actual two stages of photosynthesis, okay? So uh, remember I said to you photosynthesis is two parts. There is the part that makes... Uh, that uses sunlight, the photo part of photosynthesis, and then there's the part that makes the sugar. Today we're just going to talk about the first part, yeah? And then tomorrow we'll talk about the part that makes the, the sugar. So the part, so if you look at this little um, diagram over here, we're going we're to talk about the light reactions. Now you can see here, that uh, to make this happen, we're going to need a few things. So you've seen this diagram before. I think I've showed this to you on a bigger slide right here. 
Okay. So we're going to look at this part, and then tomorrow we'll look at this part. Okay. So what do we need to make this part work? You need light. You need water. You need NADP plus. Now you may think is that a typo because that looks a lot like NAD plus, right? It's not. It's a, another molecule, very similar, that does actually the same thing. Okay? And we're going to need ADP. And this is what we're going to make. These three things. ATP, NADPH, and a waste product. Now, the way it works is, uh, if you look at this, sunlight has to be captured. Okay? So, the first step in all of this is the capturing of uh, sunlight. So what we have here is we have these complexes. Okay, so here's one, here's another one. Okay, and they're scattered throughout. Oh yeah, where are we right now? What organelle are we in? This is the chloroplast, right? But if this was bacteria, where would it be? Cell membrane. Same story as the mitochondria, okay? It would be in the cell membrane. So because we're talking about the chloroplast, this is in the chloroplast. It's specifically in what part of the chloroplast? In these little things called thylakoids. Okay, so we're actually looking into these little disks. And these complexes are located in these membranes, okay? So that's where we are. So the idea is very, very simple. <clears throat> You have here these complexes that are um, that contain chlorophyll. Now you just saw before that chlorophyll does a really good job of absorbing what colors? Reds and the blue violets, right? So what happens is if you look at the chlorophyll, the chlorophyll um, actually, if you remember the chlorophyll molecule looks like this okay this is the chlorophyll molecule okay so uh, and it reflects green which means it doesn't really absorb the green that's why you see the green color this is what's called a porphyrin ring and in here we have what are called delocalized electrons okay so let me explain delocalized Okay, delocalized. That means the electrons can move around. Okay, because look at what's at the center of this. Magnesium. And we know that metals, what? Metals lose electrons pretty easily, right? With basic chemistry stuff. So these chlorophyll molecules have these delocalized electrons that can move around. So what happens is a really simple idea. When light energy hits them, the electrons get excited and they move. Okay, and you can actually see it here. So these are these little green things are chlorophyll molecules. So think of it like an antenna. So uh, a photon of light, which is just like a little package of light, hits the chlorophyll molecule and excites the electrons. What happens is the electrons move. Okay, and you can see that here in this diagram, and they move from uh, this complex, which is called photosystem two. So it actually starts over here. They move from here to photosystem one. So they're actually traveling, and you can see that's what the arrows are. They're traveling from one complex to another. Kind of reminds you of what stage in respiration. The electron transport chain, right? Because it's actually the same thing. Remember, for the electron transport chain to move, what did you need to happen? You had to have electrons move through the system, right? And when the electrons move through the system, what happened? Right. And here is that proton pump right here. And this proton pump is actually the same one that we find in stage four. So only one of them 
I think it's the same one as the third one, the cytochrome C. I believe it's that one. I'm pretty sure it's the same one. Uh, so the idea is, as the electrons travel through this proton pump, the pump pumps protons in. So they start to accumulate inside this thylakoid. Okay? That's the same as what you saw in respiration, right? You saw the electrons travel through the electron transport chain, and the pumps pump the protons to one side of a membrane, building a very high concentration. And that's the same thing that's happening here. What you get is a very high concentration of protons inside. That's why in this diagram, you noticed a very, see all these little dots inside? That's that high concentration. So what happens then is we know that the protons want to move where? Where do they want to go? They want to go to a low concentration. And look, they can't go through the membrane because cell membranes do not like charged particles. So they have to go through a doorway. Well, what's that doorway? ATP synthase. So if I ask you a question, do uh, plants generate ATP in pretty much the same way the electron transport chain ATP synthase generate ATP? The answer is yes. It's the same idea. Okay. So stage four in cellular respiration and this part of photosynthesis is very similar. The difference here is what made the electrons move? What excited them? Light. Okay. But other, other than that, it's very similar. It's electrons traveling through a system, powering a proton pump. This is a proton pump. Building a proton gradient. Right? And then having that, having those protons move through ATP synthase to make ATP. It's the same concept. Okay? Exactly the same. Now, that will allow us to build the ATP because if you remember, uh, going back to this little diagram, actually I'll give you the, the bigger version so you can see a little bit better. Uh, for the next stage, what do we need? We need energy to run it. To make sugar, which we'll talk about tomorrow, we need energy, okay, and we need uh NADPH. We need two things. Okay, so the electrons. You'll notice the electrons continue to move. So what happens is they go from photosystem 2 to photosystem 1. Now, by the point, time they get to photosystem 1, they would have you know, they were initially excited. By the time they get there, they will have lost that extra energy. So what happens in photosystem one, those electrons get excited again. Now, here you can see they don't generate, there's no proton pump over here, but what you have is an enzyme called NADP plus reductase. Okay? And what that enzyme does is it reduces NADP plus to make NADPH. So the electrons do two things. One is they power this proton pump over here. And the other is they reduce uh, NADP plus. Okay? Now what you're seeing here is something called non- uh, cyclic electron flow. Why is it called non-cyclic electron flow? What's a cycle? If something is cycling, what is it doing? It's coming back, right? 
So why is this called non-cyclic electron flow? Do the electrons come back? No. They, where do they end up? Okay. And it's NDP. Okay. Now we have a problem though. Here's the problem. The photosystem too, we know from chemistry, you can take electrons from something. But what happens eventually when you start taking electrons away from something? It becomes harder and harder to do so. Right? You can take electrons from iron, but once iron is positively charged, it becomes harder and harder and harder to take electrons from iron. So, in other words, you can't just keep taking electrons from photosystem too. You can take some, but then eventually you're going to have to replace it. So, where does the replacing occur? So, if you look at this term, what does lysis mean? means to break or split, okay? So one thing that happens in uh, the first part of photosynthesis, the light reaction, is water is split by something called a Z protein. And you can see it right over here, okay? Here is the splitting of water, right here. Now, why do we need to split water? This, if you think about uh, stage four respiration, okay? If you remember stage four respiration, what happens at the end? At the end, you get uh, the formation of water, right? You get um, electrons that come out of stage four because they get pulled up by what molecule? They get pulled up by oxygen, right? So two electrons are going to combine with one oxygen atom and two protons. Now, the two electrons are negatively charged, the two protons are positively charged, so they're going to cancel out, and you end up getting a molecule of water. Okay? If you think about that in reverse, that's what's happening over here. Okay? What's happening over here is water is being split, because we need two things. We need electrons, why do we need electrons, Rusha? To power the what? To power the proton pump and also to reduce NADP plus. But then we also need protons because you use what? Protons to make ATP and also to reduce NADP plus. So we need the electrons and protons to make ATP and to reduce the NADPH. If you take water and you take away the hydrogen, what are you left with? The oxygen. That's your waste product. Okay? That's the waste product. Okay? The removal of the oxygen, because we don't need it here. We don't need it. Okay? Now, this, again, I told you is called uh, non-cyclic electron flow. So here's a neat little picture. So this is a, a, a chlorophyll molecule. It gets excited. Okay, the electrons get excited. They gain energy. Now, here they have nowhere to go, so they go back. In other words, if they cannot travel through the system, which now looks like a huge mess on my table here, uh, if they have nowhere to go, they come back. Okay. They come back to their original spot. It's like if you throw something in the air, give it energy, it's going to come back to where you, you know, back to its original spot. Here is what you're seeing is when they come back, they release energy. Okay. So in this picture here, you're seeing something called fluorescence. Now, look at the color of the beaker. Kind of looks like a mixture of red. But it's not really red. It looks like if you add a little bit of blue to it, that's what it will look like. Okay? Because what colors do chlorophyll absorb? Blues and reds. So basic chemistry idea. If you absorb blue and red, so if you absorb blue and red, and you get excited, when you come back down, 
to your original state, guess what colors you release? Blue and red. Okay, blue and red. And that's what you're seeing here. Uh, so, hold on. Now, I said to you that, so that's what you're seeing in this picture here. This is still a funny picture. That's the idea, okay? You have your, uh, your photo systems, okay? Here's photo system two. Here's photo system one. These are the electrons being excited by light. This is light. And the electrons travel through the system, powering the production of ATP and also the making of NADPH. Yeah, the two ingredients we need for for uh, stage two. Now, I do want to mention what this is called. It's called photophosphorylation. So now that's the third way you learned about how to make ATP. We learned about substrate level phosphorylation, and that is when you what directly add phosphate. We learned about oxidative phosphorylation and that's when you use oxygen to run the electron transport chain and now you learn about photophosphorylation which is you use sunlight to run the electron transport chain to make ATP okay so that's the third way to make uh, to make ATP now if we compare the mitochondria and the chloroplast and the story is exactly the well, it's virtually the same. Okay, they both use an electron transport chain. They both use uh, ATP synthase. They both have membranes. Why are membranes important? Why do we need membranes? Because otherwise, if you pump out protons without membranes, what do they do? They just come back, right? They just they can go anywhere. So we need the membranes to uh, sort them, right? Without the membranes, we can't have a high concentration on one side and a low concentration on the other side. So the idea is the same, okay? Same logic. So that's an important concept. This whole thing, this whole process is called uh, chemiosmosis, okay? All right, this whole process of, of using protons and a proton gradient to make ATP is called chemiosmosis. All right, we're almost done. So we talked about chemiosmosis. It's how ATP is made by ATP synthase. Okay, so I'm going to end up with one last little concept. This diagram is the same one I just showed you. This diagram is actually the same as... Uh, as this one. It's just not showing you all of the membranes, but otherwise it's exactly the same diagram, okay? So here's your uh, photosystem uh, 2. Here's your photosystem 1. By the way, the reason why it's called photosystem 2 is because it was discovered after photosystem 1, or was it because it evolved after photosystem 1? But anyways, it was a, it's a chronological thing, okay? Um, so we talked about uh, the way it works, right? Electrons get excited, they move through the system, you get ATP, get excited again, and then you get ADPH, right? Now, and that was called uh, non-cyclic, right? Because the electrons don't come back. But I want you to look at something. I want you to look at um, the formula for cellular respiration, okay? You'll notice that this formula is a little bit different than the one I showed you. The one I showed you only had a few things. It had uh, the carbon dioxide, right? It had the water and the original formula. And then you get, you get your sugar and you get your uh, waste product, which is the oxygen. Now, plus the oxygen. Here, what you're seeing is just the, the Calvin cycle part, the part that makes the sugar. And for this part, if we focus in on what we got from the light reactions, in the light reactions, what are the two things we just talked about? 
we make what two molecules? We make ATP, right? And we make NADPH. The carbon dioxide, we don't make that. That just comes from the environment, okay? So does the water. It just comes from the environment, okay? But these two things we generate. And that's what we just talked about, okay? But if you notice, the amount that we need to make sugar is not the same for NADPH and ATP. Which do we need more of? ATP or NADPH? We need more ATP. We need 18 ATP, right? And we need 12 NADPH. So what happens is there's a good chance that you might run out of one but have enough of the other one. Which one are we more likely to run out of? Which one are you using up more? So you're more likely to run out of this one, right? We're using more of it. So what a plant can do is a plant could switch to something called cyclic electron flow. Now I want you to see if you can figure out the difference between non-cyclic and cyclic electron flow, okay? Which is explained, uh, I believe it's uh, this, this slide. Okay, so if you look at this, see the stuff that's blacked off? That is not being used. In cyclic electron flow, we're not using this, we're not using this, and we're not using this. We're only using photosystem 1. What happens is the electrons from photosystem 1, they get excited, okay? But instead of going to make uh, an ADPH, they travel through that electron transport chain. They build a proton gradient. And then you get your ATP. And then those electrons come back. So it's pretty much the same story as that beaker I just showed you. The electrons come back. Now, that's why it's called cyclic electron flow, because the electrons back. Now, in this case, what does cyclic electron flow produce and what does it not produce? Right. So you get you get this, but you don't get this. So why would a plant switch to cyclic? Because remember the formula? How many NADPH do you need? Twelve. So how many ATP do you need? 18. Which one are you more likely to run out of? This one. So if you have a, if this one's okay, and that one's okay, then we, do we need more of these? No. So we don't need to worry about making more of this right now. We need to make this molecule. And what does cyclic electron flow make? ATP. Okay. So that's why a plant will switch to it. It's a way to make ATP when you don't have enough of it, but you have enough NADPH. Okay, so why don't we end there, and what we'll do uh, tomorrow is we'll talk about how the NADPH and the ATP are used to make sugar, okay? And, that, and then tomorrow we'll wrap up uh, photosynthesis. Okay, ladies? And that is it, the end.